Welcome back for another weather and climate presentation. You know, many of the topics that I've discussed throughout our journey here uh, leads us to climate classification. You know, we understand the differences between weather and climate, which we'll reintroduce in a moment. But we also need to find a way to be able to classify regions based on their climate or long time data, their weather data. So in this presentation, we're going to learn the uh, the most widely used, the Koopen uh, Koopen <laughs> Climate Classification System. Uh, we'll utilize uh, some of the tools on how to use that, uh, the different distributions and how it works, and then we'll wrap up with a quick activity testing our knowledge to see if we can actually figure out the classification system. So that being said, let's learn about Earth's climate. So let's begin with what is climate, which kind of leads into the conversation of climate change. But before we get there, what is climate? Climate is long-term data. That includes at least 30 years of atmospheric data, all the data. We're looking at uh, precipitation, we're looking at humidity, we're looking at wind direction and variability, we're looking at velocities of those winds, we're looking at precipitation values, temperature, I mean, we're looking at all of those attributes and we're looking at long periods of time, at least 30 years, then we take it all together, we you know, jumble it together, we average it out, and we are given essentially a climate graph, a, gla a graph of climate that kind of gives the generalization of what the average April, May, June looks like. We can even do it down to the day. You know, you know what has, what is the average March 21st, you know, high, low, average over the last 30 years? Now, that being said, climate, again, is based on properties such as temperature, precipitation, air mass types, altitudes, latitude, water balances, right, uh, humid or not. Now, the last thing that I have on here is the Koopen, the Koopen Climate Classification System. Uh, it uses native vegetation, temperature, and precipitation uh, to classify regions by codes, by a, a two or or even a three letter code. And that code is interpreted as a average climate. And it's actually quite interesting. Um, you know, it's most widely used. Is it the most accurate? Well, there's really not a perfect classification system because think about it. Someone wants to classify the climate of California. Well, I mean, if you're visiting California for the first time and someone's like, oh, like, you know, what should I pack? You're like, well, are you going to Northern, Northern California? Because if you are, it's going to be probably rainy or cold. If you're going to go down to super Southern California, like San Diego area, it's going to be much more warm. You know, it, we, it's not uncommon for us to have, like, you know, record-breaking three-digit heat in one part of California and it being rainy and snowy in another part. So it's very hard for us to classify the climate of large regions. So we do have to break it down into smaller uh, realms, you know, smaller areas, and that does help as well. That being said, when we start seeing the long-term data changing, that's when we observe and identify climate change, right? You know, when we see a freak weather system that happens, you know, a very odd thing that happens, we call that an anomaly, right? That's just a weird system that, you know, one day it's 90 degrees, the next day it's 50, and it goes back to 90 degrees. There's usually an explanation for that, but, which is not climate change, right? That's an anomaly. It's a weird weather system. But when we're seeing general, dramatically measured changes over 30 years. Maybe we're looking at a, a quarter of a, of, a, of a degree increase over the last 30 years every year. That is very measurable change that is climactic. It Because remember, the word climate is the average of long periods of time. So just one event doesn't really count as climate change, right? But when we see more and more of these events starting to change, then that's when we have a problem, which happens to be a situation that we're dealing with because we have these classifications for climate based on, again, temperature, precipitation, air mass types, altitude, water balances, so on and so forth. But these air, some areas are starting to be different, which means they need to be classified differently. Yet we've classified them a certain way for you know 150 years based on just general knowledge. And now we have to give it a whole new classification because there's areas in Siberia that can have lush meadows that for the last you know, for the last human record have been covered in snow. So we are seeing changes. And so that does, you know, obviously alter the climate classification. So what I want to look at first is now that we've covered what is climate, let's look at climate types. 
So let's look at some climate types. So again, we've got this classification that I mentioned. We're going to utilize the Koopen climate classification, uh, which uses a series of letters to represent uh, the average climate. So the first letter is the general climate. You know, is it tropical, dry, mid-latitude, mild? Is it severe mid-latitude? Is it polar um, or even a highland? So the first letter distinguishes really the region and the overall climate. So, you know, as an example, we can see that it's given a letter A if it represents a tropical climate. It's given a letter B if it represents a dry region. C is mild mid-latitude, which is, uh, I live in Santa Clarita, which is kind of our area here. Um, D is severe mid-latitude, which for me, uh, severe mid-latitude really is any any region of California that experiences genuine seasons where they actually get snow, where they get rain, where they get, you know, so I'm looking at more of northern, northeastern California. Uh, we also have polar which is where you know uh, all months are lower than 10 degrees Celsius. It's very, very cold, very, very limited precipitation because of that. And we also have an area that kind of gets lumped in here known as H, which is a highlands. So the first letter is the type itself, um, you know, the name. And then, and then, now this is a very, just hang on, <laughs> this is a very simple diagram. So the way it's broken is that some get only two letters, some get all three. The second letter itself uh, represents the amount of precipitation on average and it's very specific for each letter and then the third letter represents the temperature uh, which again is very specific so as you can see uh, for letter A, which is considered a tropical area, if it's a tropical rainforest, it would be considered an AF. If it's going to be a tropical monsoonal area, it's going to be an A lowercase m. And notice that down here on the right hand side, there's some criteria which is very, very complicated. And I understand that. I'm not going to ask you to, to understand this really, but because um, I have another one we'll use that's broken down a bit more. But I mean, I wanted to share this because this is the real form that is used. And it's broken down into uh, looking at you know temperature, looking at precipitation, evap evapotranspiration. It's looking at a lot of different elements. But I just wanted to share this because you can really see. Okay, so if it's a B, it could be you know it's. I compare it as we get to it. It's like a build your own adventure in a sense because you kind of like well if it's if you chose a B, your next option could be a capital W or a capital S, and then you get to kind of like pick your way across the uh, the screen. But what's neat about that is then when you're done, you could say, you know, oh, I live in Santa Clarita, or I live in Victorville, or I live in uh, Alameda, then you could give it a three letter code, generally, and then someone could look at this chart and go, oh, well, so you live in an area that experiences this average temperatures, so maybe it's hot summers, but very cold winters, you receive less than so many inches or, or uh, centimeters of precipitation, and this is your general latitude. Like all of that can be derived from just these three codes. So how does this look on like a big map? Well, here we are with a large map showing, uh, again, just the main climate system, tropical, dry, uh, moist, mild, moist, severe, polar, and then highlands. So we can have our letters there. Uh, but look at, the, I guess like this because it gives us a couple different attributes. The first one it's giving us is just a spatial distribution of where these climates are found. Great. The, then on top of that, it adds in areas of high pressure. It's showing in warm oceanic currents versus cold ones, so it causes mixture. So we get to see a lot of different attributes. We also see the rotating ITZZ, the intertropical convergence zone. So we see that there are a lot of things that are in relation. Then on top of that, <laughs> we can add in latitude. We can add in topography when we talk about the rain shadow effect. So we can start to see a lot of these different elements that are here, uh, which I think kind of helps put it in perspective. So this is that first diagram. So maybe we're, you know, think about where you live. You know, it, it, does this seem appropriate for the area in which you reside? Then let's complicate it. This is the options. Um, now there are variations of different codes. So we can see that, uh, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe you can see where your little home might be. Um, you know, I live up in this area in Santa Clarita, so I'm closer to a CSA, uh, C lowercase s, s lowercase a, CSA, which is somewhat Mediterranean, which is weird to think that we have a similar climate to Greece, but we do. Um, you know, but we can see all these different codes, and all these different codes mean something specifically. 
Again, we can see patterns based, if I kind of go back and forth, we can see there's our patterns with these high pressure bubbles. We can see there are pressure, you know, uh, correlations with latitude. We can see those correlations with topography. I mean, you can see right on here, the Sierra Nevada, you can see the Rockies. I mean, we can see, uh, you know, all of these different, even parts of the Appalachians, we can see this for ourselves. And then there is a correlation with climate and weather patterns because of that. So what I want to do next is I'm going to actually break down each climate letter, uh, main primary letter, right? Um, so I'm going to break it apart into letters A, B, C, D, and E and H. And we're going to break it down into each part. So that being said, let's start with letter A. So type A climates can be broken up. I'm just showing a very small variation of some of the codes. We'll see some additional. I mean, it can be very specific. I'm just going to give a very nice generalized round, uh, you know, well breadth of uh, the types of climates we have. But a type A climate is considered a tropical climate. It's warm annual temperatures, very little variation, distinguished uh, specifically by precipitation as we'll see in a moment, and it's somewhere between the equator and about 10 degrees north and south. So in this case I wanted to share three options. You have AF, AM, AW. And notice that it's based off of just two letters because we'll find that one of the letters that would normally be added, this, well, which is temperature, the last one, there's no variation. It's very, very, this very much the same. So there's no distinguishing part of that. But when it comes to precipitation, there are. As we can see, the first one is an AF, which is tropical wet, meaning that it has even precipitation throughout the entire year and humid. We also have monsoonal, which is an AM. Uh, AM uh, is a transition between tropical wet dry, meaning that you have extreme hot, uh, wet and dry seasons. So when I think of monsoonal areas, I mean, I think of, you know, first that comes to mind is India, uh, when they have, you know, months of extreme precipitation, but they also have months of extreme dryness. So it's kind of like a, a balance between the two which also brings us into tropical wet and dry, which is an AW, where they occur closer towards the poleward sides of the tropics, much farther north, where it's really, really, ooh, <laughs> really split uh, between, I spelled dry wrong, uh, a very nice, clean, wet and dry side of an area. So one is completely wet, one is very dry. So that's a very good um, representation of that. So let's see what that looks like on a map. So these are just showing the prominent three ones, AF, AM, and AW. Uh, again, we can see that there are correlations with latitude. Uh, we can also see that there are correlations within um, uh, just their regions. We can see that the AF, tropical, is right along the tropic, uh, the equator, and you know stretches within the tropics for the most part. Uh, there are some random other spots that do receive some of this more, as we can see, uh, tropical, wet, dry, and even monsoonal, which is much closer to uh, the 40th parallel on either side. But we can certainly see that there are correlations. I think this, I mean, this is the same as the other map I shared a moment ago, but we're going to break them down into each letter. So that is letter A, which is more of your tropical region. Uh, again, it's distributed specifically based on precipitation. So it's either wet all the time, uh, it's wet almost all the time, and it's wet most of the time. <laughs> so you know we're really dealing with areas with extreme precipitation. The next letter we'll look at is letter B. Now, B-type climates are generally drier. Uh, as we can see here, uh, dry climates they occur in areas where evaporation will exceed that of its precipitation, So, which means that if you had a large container outside to catch all the rain, that throughout the course of the year, the bucket would always be dry because it would, there would never be enough precipitation to keep a, you know, a balance you know, or a, a, enough in there to be measurable It'll continue to dry out throughout the course of a year. So we give it a capital B, then, then we get you know, two other letters as well. So we, it's broken up into, um, well, technically four groups. We have first two, you have subtropical, then you have mid-latitude, then it's broken up into either uh, desert or broken up into steppe. So tropical deserts, which is a BWH, is between 5 and 30 degrees of latitude, high temperatures, very low precipitations. Uh, BSH is a tropical is a uh, sorry is a, a tropical steppe, which is like an arid grasslands or savanna. So still higher temperatures, but they do get a short rainy season, but still <laughs> there's not enough to keep that water all all year round. Then we have the mid-latitude desert and a mid-latitude um, steppe as well. Uh, again, mid-latitude is cold and hot deserts, and then the steppe is cold and hot semi-arid, which means it's not as intense but still very dry. You know, what's very interesting about this whole idea is that you know, when we think about type B, which is dry areas, and we think of deserts, 
you know, as an example, we can see that within the first uh, subtropical areas, more like Mojave, uh, and then the mid latitudes, more like the Chihuahuan Desert. But deserts are always dry. They're not always hot. They can be very, very cold. Uh, it's, but the key is that they're always, always dry. So let's look at this on a map. So this is our map of B, as in boy, climates. So we can see again that we're, we're beyond the uh, majority of the equatorial zone. Are there still areas on the equator that experience this? Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's, a, it's not a very clear line, right, for all of these. There is going to be some rollover uh, depending on average um, you know, year length uh, values, but we certainly see that we're identifying a distinct correlation right along the tropics themselves. So you're right at that that end point of those areas. Uh, we can certainly also observe that there are correlations. You know, thinking about like what's right along in here, you've got some of the tallest mountains in the world. I mean. They're the tallest are over here, but these are pretty, pretty tall down here. So is there uh, you know, an effect with that? And the answer is yes. We can see again that latitude correlation. So a nice way of, of visualizing letter B. Now, we've looked at two extremes, right? We've looked at letter A, which is you know incredible amounts of precipitation. Now we've looked at the opposite where it's, you know, you have incredible amounts of non-precipitation. Uh, now we're going to look at letter C, which is somewhere in the middle. It's more of a Mediterranean climate. So let's look at letter C. Now C type climates are more comfortable. See what I did with the letter C? So they're mild mid latitudes, also found between 30 and 45 degrees. Again, mild winters, hot summers, so much more Mediterranean uh, in that vision. So, you know, for Mediterranean types, uh, mild to hot summers, uh, but dry. Uh, very mild precipitation, uh, but it also varies, right, and during the winter. Uh, during the sub, uh, so the humid subtropical, we have long, hot, humid summers. Winters are much cooler than that of the Mediterranean, but still, again, uh, very humid. Then we get to the marine west coast, which is kind of unique. Uh, cold ocean currents will influence the climate overall. Fog and rain with low annual precipitation values. So, like, to put in perspective for myself, Marine West Coast is more like a Santa Monica area, what we consider the west side. Uh, Mediterranean area, you know, I'm thinking more of Santa Clarita for CSA. That's where I live by Six Flags Magic Mountain. And then more like a humid subtropical. Um, that's going to be a little bit farther north, probably closer to like uh, Ojai, um, you know, maybe even more inland than Santa Barbara, maybe more of like Salinas type stuff area, but uh, you know, more of that somewhere in between, right, of those two. So C is more comfortable. Uh, so that, that kind of wraps up our C climates. Let's look at it on a map, which is like this. So here we are with our C climates. Uh, we can see it is scattered throughout uh, the middle of the US, mostly on the um, southeastern side, otherwise it's all along the west coast. Uh, but we also do have some areas just south of Brazil and within, uh, you know, looking at most of the upper Atlantic but again, do we see lateral, uh, you know, some form of continuity there? And the answer is yes, we do. Uh, absolutely. And again, if I even pulled in that other map that showed our weather systems, I mean, I could actually, I can do that. I mean, do we see any patterns here? You know, this is looking at the bigger picture. Yes. Looking at those big high pressure systems. Does that play a role on this? Uh, well, actually, yes, it does, right? Because we can see this is kind of that boundary zone of these high pressure systems. Um, so it's just kind of interesting to kind of put it in perspective. So that wraps up letter C. Uh, the next one we're going to look at is letter D, uh, which is a little bit more, um, well, I guess I'll get into it. I consider it like Delaware, and you'll see why in a moment. So let's move on to letter climate type D. Now, letter D is a little more complicated. It's considered severe mid-latitude, very cold winters, large continental areas, and precipitation is distributed evenly. I compared it to Delaware just a moment ago because when I th I've never been to Delaware, but when I think of Delaware, I think that they genuinely receive seasons, right? Like they have long periods of fall, long periods of summer, long periods of winter, and long periods of spring. It gets very hot during the summer, but it's also very cold during the winter. So you, we kind of have this nice balance, right? Versus California, right? We like to think that we have seasons, but it's either warm, hot, or warm, or hot, right? It kind of ba balances back and forth. So th that being said, since we're dealing with very large areas that are also continental, uh, we're also looking at, again, precipitation and temperature values. There's a lot more options here. But again, this is letter D. So we have two families, humid continental and then subarctic. So humid continental is really you know, an 
you know, part of the eastern continent between 40 and 55 degrees north. Uh, warm to hot summers, but very cold winters and lots of precipitation. So snow, right? Uh, and then subarctic is a little bit different. Um, Subarctic is right up below that. It's uh, usually it's warm but short summers, very very cold winters, low amounts of precipitation, and if they does have precipitation, it's usually throughout the summers, uh, but generally more moist. So what does that look like on a map? So here we can see. You know, again, remember, three quarters of our lands or of our land masses are found in the northern hemisphere. So we don't see a lot of this obviously in the southern hemisphere, but we can see again most of uh, you know northern North America. So including. Again, Delaware, see how I did that with letter D, uh, and farther north up into Alaska. This is where we're really seeing a lot of change, actually. We're starting to see that there is a, we're starting to see a an imbalance of these letters. We're starting to see that more of these colors are starting to kind of run into one another, uh, specifically because as climate has continued to change, we're finding that, you know, these lines of latitude that have been very strong dividing attributes of our weather are starting to you know, march more north. So we're seeing that areas that were once very cold covered in ice or snow are starting to become very lush pastures, uh, you know, very green meadows. And so we're starting to see, which is, you know, in one argument is kind of cool because now areas that were no longer, that were never sustainable in agriculture can now just start grow stuff. But that's also a dramatic change because that's a store, that's our storage of fresh water, you know, for our planet. So we're starting to see a, a slight imbalance uh, throughout these colors. So that wraps up letter D. So the next one is going to be letter E, which I also kind of lump into uh, letter H, which is highlands. But we're looking at areas that are Arctic or very, very high uh, elevation or altitude. So let's move on to letter E. Now, letter E type climates are letter, I should say, slow down. <laughs> Letter E type climates are polar climates and highlands. Very cold, very limited precipitation, and generally latitudes above 70. Now, what's interesting about that is it's very cold, very low precipitation. Arguably, you could almost say that some of these areas are considered a letter B, right? Because letter B or deserts are based on temperature and precipitation. These are very cold, great. What about the precipitation? None. They're deserts, right? So a lot of our tundra and ice caps, even though they're covered in ice, can technically be classified as a desert in a sense, right? Because you're receiving very limited precipitation. It's just that the ice is, you know, hanging. it's very old, and so it hangs around. So we have three values that we're gonna look at, the tundra, ice caps, and highlands. Tundra gets its name from its vegetation alone, severe winters, mild summers with very long days. Remember, these are latitudes above uh, the Arctic or Antarctic Circle, so there's, you know, the experience at some points months of daylight and months of darkness uh, so they do see that variation but again because of the incident rays and angles even though it's 24 hours of daylight it's very low energy ice caps or EF uh, constant um, oh, use coverage uh, it's one of those days guys uh, ice coverage, warmest temps are about zero degrees Celsius, so freezing. And then last is highland. Uh, based on topography, not latitude, uh, climate changes as we continue up the uh, you know up the slope of a mountain. So I'm not talking like the San Gabriels or anything or or the Santa Susanas. I mean we're talking about uh, highlands as being the tops of like maybe Mount Whitney or maybe the tops of Everest or the tops of um, the um, uh, Atacama Desert. You know, we're looking at these areas of extreme uh, altitude or elevation. So let's look at what these look like on a map. So here's our map of E, T, E, F, and H. So we certainly see mountain ranges. I mean, are there you know topographic uh, relations with these? I can certainly see them. You know, I can see the Himalayas over here. I can see part of the Rockies over here. Um, so I do see that there are correlations, but I see areas that are extreme ice caps. I can see areas of highlands, which is denoted by those mountain ranges, and then filled within the blanks are the tundras. So again, this is just a way that we classify regions and realms based off of their, you know, their latitude, their average climate, their precipitation values, and their average temperature. So what does this look like? I, you know, I shared a graph uh, earlier. Uh, I'll go back to it. This one. Remember, this was pretty complicated. So how do we really utilize this graph when talking about our climates? Well, that's a great question. So now we're going to learn how to do it. It's an activity. We're going to apply what we know, uh, which is what I like to call putting it together. 
Now, as mentioned earlier on, I love those build your own adventures, and that's exactly how we're going to interpret this activity, is that we're gonna break this up into three steps. So what I provided in the bottom right-hand corner is the average you know, climate uh, and weather data from Palmdale, California. So as you can see, I've got Palmdale, California. The average elevation have also been able to provide the latitude and the longitude. I have also provided for each month the minimum and the maximum precipitation and overall temperature, as well as the um, averages of those temperatures and the average uh, precipitation values. So, I mean, the, what, the areas that are most important for us right now are gonna be the averages. That's the easiest way to do this. So we're gonna utilize the average temperature throughout the course of a year and look at the average rain per month over the course of a year to, to create a three letter code for Palmdale, California. So the first thing we have to do is pick our first letter. We have our options A through E. Now looking at letter A, tropical, low latitude, I mean it's 34 degrees north, that's not a low latitude, and I can tell you right now it's not tropical if you've ever been to Palmdale. So my next option would be letter B, as in dry, uh, boy, for dry. Not latitude specific, but evaporation exceeds precipitation, uh, typically in California areas with less than 15 inches of rain per year. So I go down here and go rain per inches per year. They only get about seven inches of rain per year. That's not very much. So I'm gonna keep that in the back of my mind that it could be letter B. In fact, I'm gonna grab a little red dot right here. I'm gonna keep that at letter B because that's where I'm thinking about it could be next. Letter C is considered mesothermal, more like, you know, more uh, Mediterranean, mild winters, warm or hot summers. So I can look down here and go, well, let's see, mild winter. I mean, we're looking at temperatures 45, 49, 52, I mean, that's pretty cold. And then we get into the summers, it's not too bad, and you're looking at 70s and 80s. So it's not maybe warm or hot. Um, I don't know if that's quite mild. So I'm gonna move on to letter D, very cold, no. Polar, no. I want to go, I'm going to stick with letter B. I'm going to think it's more of your drier area just based on that precipitation. The best part about this is if it doesn't work, it lets you know and you got to go back over again. So since we picked letter B, we get to choose a second letter, either a capital W or a capital S. So is it an arid or is it semi-arid? So in, these, in this case here, we have to decide in California, it's usually less than 10 inches. Semi-arid is in California, uh, but generally less than 15. Oh, well, for sure it's gonna be a W, right? That's, that makes the most, uh, most sense, because as we can see here, it says, actually, let me do this way. I'll, I'll keep my letter B up here too, so we can just kind of see the pattern I went through. Um, less than 10, we're only getting 6.92 inches, so I'm gonna stick with BW. That sounds pretty good. My next one will be, since I chose a B, my third letter can be an H or a K. So I need to decide, is it a hot desert or is it a cold desert? Is the average temperature above 65 or is it below? Well, the average temperature is below 65. So therefore, I'm gonna go ahead and move this and I'm gonna say it's a K. So my option should be, my answer for this would be a B, W, K. And that would reference Palmdale Lancaster. What did I use? I used this temperature, I'm sorry, this uh, precipitation value. I used this. Uh, in some cases, if you're looking at maybe a different letter, it might ask you to look for the you know the wettest or uh, the driest month. So that's why I'm kind of using these little bubbles to kind of point it out. But these are the areas that I use. So for those who've ever been to Palmdale, Lancaster, this is what we're saying using this this uh, grouping by saying it's a B W K. We would say, oh, Palmdale. Perfect. So it's a, considered a colder desert. The average precipitation, uh, uh, precipitation itself is generally below 10 inches of rain. The average temperature is uh, below 65 throughout the course of the entire year, uh, 65 degrees Fahrenheit. We also find that it's not really latitude specific, but it's just, you know, it's an area that receives some rainfall, but just not enough. So the, you know, the evaporation exceeds precipitation in that area. That's what that would look like. So, just for fun, um, like I said, I live by Magic Mountain, and I know that Magic Mountain is a code on here. 
I know, I know which one it is. I'm gonna move all these away. Um, we know that Santa Clarita is mesothermal because we live here where we have mild winters but warm hot summers. Um, in fact, we don't receive any precipitation during the summer, it's only during the winters. We also then taking that letter C for Santa Clarita, um, I can choose F, M, W, or S, wet year round, nope. I mean, if, you're, if you've been to Magic Mountain, you know that's not the case. Monsoonal, or it's extremely wet or extremely dry, no. Is it dry in the winter, no. Uh, dry in the summer, rains in the winter, yes. So I'm gonna go with that. So, so far I'm at a CS, then I go over here, letter C. I said it's a CS, let's find our third letter. Uh, again, hot summer's warmest month is over 72. Uh, is it a warm summer where it's below 72? A cool summer or a cold summer? No. If you've been to Magic Mountain during the summer, you know it's hot. So we are considered a CSA in Santa Clarita. Our climate classification is a CSA. So that's essentially how this is done. It's a build your own adventure. I think that this chart is probably easier for us you know, as a novice on how to classify our climate versus the original one I shared earlier. But I think this really puts it in perspective. So how do we do this? We essentially have to just get the climate data. Now, this is, can also be viewed as a table like this, but it can also be viewed as a climate graph, where it's a graph of this climate, where, they, <coughs> excuse me, where you just plot uh, the average precipitation, average temperature over the course of a year. And you can see that bell curve and you can solve it from there as well. But I think it's really about deductive reasoning and walking yourself through it because, you know, as an example, uh, the Bay Area, you know, it rains a lot in the Bay Area, but it's not, you know, it doesn't classify as tropical, right? So it's going to be a very different letter. I mean, you could label as tropical, but it's not going to fit all that criteria. So it really brings you into that deductive reasoning. So that being said, since you're here, don't forget to like uh, this video uh, and subscribe if you have not done so already, but Google your, where you live and find out what your climate classification code is. So Google where you live, Google the Copen climate, throw it in the comments below, and let's decide if we agree or not. That being said, I appreciate your time and we'll talk soon.